Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I am delighted to be your host, and I'm excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the fifth episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. If you want to find out more about me or what the show is about, feel free to listen to any of the previous episodes, and you can catch those on my website, carolcoaching.com or voiceamerica.com on the business channel. And be sure to download the app. If by chance you missed last week's show, I interviewed Ann Taylor, who's an executive coach and author of the book, Soft Skills, Hard Results, offering a pragmatic guide for the driven leader. We discussed the emotional intelligence and the emotional mastery of both effective leaders and not so effective leaders. So be sure to check it out. Now, I am very happy to announce today's guest, a dear friend of mine, Juliet Craig. Juliet, welcome. Thank you for asking. It's great to have you here. Now, Juliet, you and I have known each other, I calculated it recently, 36 years. We have actually been adults and have known each other since that time. Yikes. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. So for the people out there who want to do the math, we were college freshman roommates together. And over the years, we flowed in and out of contact and still remain good friends today. Now, three months ago, we were having one of those long overdue catch-up chats. And yeah. it, right, remember, it was intense. <laughs> and at one point, we started talking about white privilege. Now, we're going to share some of that discussion with you shortly. And first, let me give you some background and a little more information about Juliet. Uh, I remember, Juliet, when we were at Illinois Wesleyan together, you were studying theater, and then it turns out you got your Bachelor of Fine Arts in theater at the University of New Mexico. Then you got a Master of Arts in Journalism at the University of Arizona. I love how I'm telling you this. You're like, yes, Amy, I know that. <laughs> That's for the listeners. <laughs> Though something I, ha I didn't remember about you is that you spent seven years working in public radio for your local community radio station. And then for the last 21 years, you've been a special education teacher for the Albuquerque Public Schools. Now, Juliet is passionate about the power of community radio and its ability to evoke social change. So that's an additional thing that we're going to be talking about later in the show. Though, Juliet, I don't know if you remember this. It was about 12, 13, I don't know, maybe 14 years ago. And I had come to Albuquerque for a couple of weeks to take a, a training on nonviolent communication. And you and I arranged to meet up. And it had been a long time since we had seen each other. So again, it was one of those major catch-up times. And when we were out having dinner, I remember you asking me, so Amy, what do you do professionally? And I said, oh, well, uh, I'm a communication coach and trainer. And I help people to be able to have more effective conversations, be able to deliver delicate, difficult messages, and essentially to be able to manage themselves effectively under pressure. And your response was, oh yeah, I remember you did that with me. I said, what are you talking about? That's not possible. You're like, no, 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 you coached me. I said, Juliet, I, and that was, and that would have been something like 10 years before I had even started my own business, <laughs> that I apparently took it upon myself to coach you. And so I want you to share that story because I don't remember all the details. We were both living in Chicago. That's what I remember. Yeah, it was after college and I was in a desperate situation because I was being exploited by a talent agency that had hired me as a trade show and convention model. So I was representing products at conventions and trade shows and sometimes on the streets of Chicago, I'd walk around doing direct marketing with product samples. And I sometimes had to do presentations at the trade shows where I would do a demo of how a product worked. Yeah. And so I was putting a lot of enormous energy into packaging myself and trying to shine it on for these customers and for my agents who were representing me, but they did not pay me. And apparently they were not paying all the girls in their employees, all of us were being strung along and, and scammed and the agency was a, was a scam. And so That's right. um, you, you, you realized that I was in, that I was about to be 
you know, scammed out of thousands of dollars because I kept believing them when they said that the clients right. hadn't paid. And so you said, this is really serious. You've got to get the guts up to go into that agency when there's a crowd in the office, when there's other prospective raw talent there waiting to be hired by them. And you've got to make a scene in front of an audience. Oh, jeez. Demand. You said you have to demand. You refuse to leave the lobby of the office if you are not cut a check on the spot. And I was scared. It's, it's, I, it's ironic for me to hear this, you know, it's, so this was clear to me when you described this, I was still in my predator stage of, of coaching <laughs> yeah. style, it sounds like. Yeah, and oh, it's yeah. true, it's true that I've always, I would go predator, what I call myself, uh, I would call it being a protective predator. If someone was taking advantage of me or someone else or disrespecting me or someone else, that's when I would want to go predator. So just hearing the story again, I can feel like that inner predator coming up and, you know, wanting to come to your defense. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so go on. You said, you said, Juliet, you are going to be another victim unless mm. you can muster the courage from deep down inside and, and just basically chain yourself to the floor in front <laughs> of an unsuspecting audience. You are not, you know, you're going to let them walk away with all your wages. And so wow. it worked. And the best part was, I mean, and I was shocked that it worked. But it totally worked because they didn't want to lose face in front of all those other girls that they could take advantage of. Right. And then I got, they cut me a check for like $4,000. And then within a few weeks, the agency just closed up shop in the middle of the night, leaving probably, you know, a hundred or more girls with nothing. Wow. Okay. So let's back up. Cause this is, I think if I was a listener, I'd be like, okay, I want the details. So um, can you remember, even though this was 30 something years ago, can you remember like what you said and how they reacted and what ended up happening that you got that check in your hands? Well, you had to coach me how to find my inner lion. Mm. You know, I had to be this person that was the mama lion that would, you know, that had cubs to feed and I needed to go in there and and make them realize that i was in charge now and they mm. were not going to get away with this anymore and i had to be a different person i had to tap into a, a different sense of entitlement that i never had yeah oh that's interesting because we're going to be talking about that a bit later so that uh, stepping into this different character was what allowed you to give you gave you that the gumption and the bravery to act that way. Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. And I'm glad that my coaching didn't cause it to turn out in a negative way. I'm relieved to know, <laughs> considering yeah. I hadn't even been trained as a coach at that point. <laughs> I was just giving opinions. Yeah. I was so grateful that I, I came to you and you knew exactly what I needed to do. I mean, you saved me. I would have Oh my God, I couldn't have survived. I was, you know, I was, I really needed that money. Right. And $4,000 30 years ago was a huge <laughs> amount of money. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was an idiot. I really was um, just a walking around with, um, don't hit me on my face, you know? <laughs> well, you know, Jules, you, uh, I think a lot of people would want to beat themselves up and that's, you know, you think, oh, I'm an idiot. I, there is a sense of enormous generosity that you have. And sometimes we are, we, we grow up, you know, many of us, we might have the luxury to grow up and have a certain level of naivete before we realize, okay, we can't always trust everyone. Um, so, you know, it, I hope that you can also see the flip side of, of you, who you are and who you were even back then as a person that, made it unfortunately easy for people to take advantage of you. Oh yeah, that's a good insight. No, that's really true. Mm. So what I wanna, um, you know, the, the reason I had originally invited you on the show is because I was so intrigued by that catch up conversation that we had three months ago. And I'd love for you to share with the listeners some of your background growing up so they, we, you know, they get a sense of who you, were and, and what your life was like at an early age. 
Then we're going to get to that aha moment you had so recently around your privilege that you had never even identified it as a form of privilege. So let's jump in. Do you want to talk about like the evolution starting from your youth? Well, so I had this really colorful childhood. I grew up in truly extreme poverty. I, I was on welfare. We, my family was on welfare, but more, but before we went on welfare, there were times when we were living in a car. Wow. We were living as a family at roadside hotels, sometimes in a tent. Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt very scared a lot of the time. It was a very um, unpredictable time where I had long periods where I was unsupervised. And so um, I got into a lot of dangerous situations. Mm -hmm. um, my brother and I, most significantly, we lost a year of school. Um, I was about, I guess I was in first grade when it happened, when it really, uh, when times really got tough. Um, I, we were being evicted from our apartment in Chicago. Yeah. And I was walking home from school and my mom said, you can take two toys and get in the car. Her boyfriend had a Volkswagen and um, it wasn't a, a big car. It was a small car. Right. <laughs> and it was me and my brother and my mom and her boyfriend. And I said, where are we going? And my mom said, we're going west. She was so excited. You know, she doesn't look back on those years as homeless. She looks back on those years as we were traveling. Wow. You know, she, she saw it as an option. And I'm sure that for her, it felt like an option. She was, she felt like, well, let's just enjoy the moment. You know, yeah. we're being evicted and my boyfriend has a car. So let's just see what the world holds. And, 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 and as, a, as an adult, that has a, it's a very different impact than as a small child to have your stability and structure ripped away from you. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the thing is about my mom, and I know she feels so guilty about this and she, you know, it, it hurts her so much to hear that this was very damaging, very traumatizing to both me and my brother. And that's right. really hard for her to, to deal with. Sure. But she didn't ever consider that. And it's because of the kind of person she is. She's an yeah. intellectual, but she's also a rolling stone. And she has this inner voice that tells her, there is no, no trespassing sign that you will not climb over. Oh, geez. That's so, what guides her. <laughs> okay. With knowing that as the, some of the foundation that you had, what then happened as you got a little bit older, I think like around, let's say 10, 11, 12 years old. Right. So when I, that's when I really needed to try to change my situation. So I got, I started I had a paper route when I was 11. I started having a, but it wasn't a paper route where, where I had to get up every day early in the morning. It was a paper that was an afternoon paper so I could deliver it after school. So that okay. was one of my first jobs. And then after that, I started having some really difficult employment experiences because I was so young. I was easy to exploit me. And I felt so embarrassed about kind of how pitiful my life was that mm -hmm. I, I, I was easy. It was easy to take advantage of me. And we had a job, me and my mom, we were babysitting for some people and they um, called me in one day and they said, we just found out that your mother is receiving welfare benefits. And so we cannot be employing you and her because that's money under the table and that's yeah. immoral. And so we are going to be um, letting her go. She and we're going, but we don't feel it's your fault that your mother. Yeah, I'm 12 at the time. Um, wow. that, that you don't. We don't feel it's your fault, and we don't feel we should take this out on you. So we don't feel we should pay you as much as what we were paying her. We were paying her a dollar seventy-five an hour, and we can pay you a dollar fifty an hour. And um, and I. And I said, of course, I would be, you know, happy to do it. And, you know, they were degrading and humiliating me. And so I went home and I told my mother what had happened. And she was yeah. angry at me. She oh, was angry. Wow. She said I had undercut her. 
um, I, I was shocked that she felt that way, but she desperately needed the money. And, right. and then suddenly she was fired and I am replaced by me and I'm working for less money. I mean, so that was hard. And I told her, I'll give you half of whatever I make. Yeah. And that became the practice that I embraced, which was, you know, I can change this situation a little bit, you know, by getting, gaining a sense of control. I needed to mm. control it. So you had that job for how long? And then, cause you said you started about 11 with the paper route. Then you had this job, which well, I got that. Okay. So I got the job working for this family. I had that for three years. So I started seventh grade, eighth grade and ninth grade working for this family. And this family, <laughs> well, it was a real Cinderella kind of a situation. That's and uh, I wanna, uh, I'm going to interrupt because there's so many juicy nuggets that I want to um, make sure we get to integrate. So give me a, a, a summary on this family and then tell us what the next challenging job was. Okay, so this family had me work every day after school in seventh grade. I would take the bus to the, the city bus to get to their house after school uh, five days a week and I would take the, their little girls to the park this was in Chicago Lakeshore Drive and I would take the kids to the park and then we'd come home and then I'd help set the table and entertain the kids for before dinner then I'd set the table and the family would eat dinner in the dining room I had to eat alone every night behind their kitchen door, their swinging kitchen door, while they ate in the dining room. And then they rang a dinner bell and would call wow. me in when they were done. And I would clear the plates. And then I would take the girls and give them a bath. And then I'd go back to the kitchen and do all the dishes. And then I'd take the bus home at night. You know, I'd get home around 9, 30, 10, and then and again, um, you were what age? Well, I would say 13, 12, 13, 14 in those years. Those okay. Years. So this is the part that I'm getting to. Okay. So this is interesting to me now. So um, all these years you had this work and how is that impacting your ability in school? Well, it had a huge impact on my ability to do any work at my school. I, I could not do any homework. I was never a great student. Uh -huh. I had always had an issue with being absent from school. I was often, I was frequently late or absent. And so my freshman year of, of high school, I was failing most of my classes. Wow. I, yeah, I could not keep up with the workload. I was so tired all the time. And so what I, ended up doing, thank God, was I was able to transfer my sophomore year of high school to a school that had a very different pace of instruction. How I would you describe it? Well, I, I transferred to a high school that was in an area of the city that was being gentrified. So uh -huh. the city had... Um, the school had had huge problems. The test scores of the kids were very low. This was in 1979. They, um, the, it was basically considered a ghetto high school and they had huge problems with gang violence and, um, and, the, and then low grades. And so they, the district was responding by saying, maybe if we open up the program and we take kids from around the city, not just yeah. from the neighborhood schools, we can integrate the school more. So it was going to be integrated. So when I went to the school, I was one of the very, very few whites that was at the school. Uh -huh. And you chose to go there because you were failing out of your other school. And this was like kind of like a last ditch yeah. effort. Well, you know, it was an arts emphasis. So they had an arts program that they were trying to start. And I was theatrical and dramatic. Mm. And so I thought maybe if they had a different pace of instruction and if they were much more understanding because these are kids in trauma, these are children, the students in the school have been through so much. They, they lived in housing projects, many of them in the community. Yeah. They lived in a very notorious housing project in the city of Chicago. And then it, they needed, the teachers needed to have an understanding of what it's like to 
work with students who are dealing with huge trauma in their home lives. And so in that environment, the pace of instruction was much more forgiving. Okay, so am I hearing that what you're saying is um, part, and because you, you told me once that, that, that what happened was you succeeded, you did very, very well. In fact, you even graduated at, at the top of your class. Well, yeah, and I was never a good student. So that was interesting because looking back, I realize now that I was very fortunate in so many ways because even though economically I was the same as my classmates in high yeah. school, we were all economically disadvantaged. In so many ways, the neighborhood that I went home to, which was a white neighborhood, was in so many ways rich with privilege that I had never been able to see before. And then when I compare myself to my classmates, I, I realize now what they were up against was so unfair. I mean, it just was not a level playing field. And so, like, for example, um, when I was a sophomore in high school, my first year at that school, yeah, I had a, a partnership with a uh, a black girl in my class to do a project together. We were working on a history fair project. So it was a big project. And she invited me over to her house to work on the project with her there. And so yeah. I got her address and she explained that we couldn't meet at my house and we couldn't meet at an outside location because she was already a mother and we were only like 15 years old and we're sophomores in high school. And she already had a two-year-old son. <gasps> wow. And so she, she didn't have the liberty to just, you know, right. meet, meet me for coffee and we or meet at my house after school. And, and so I go to her house, which is in this extremely impoverished part of the city, a part of the city that I would normally never go into. It was yep. a part of the city that, you know, it was high crime and, um, I definitely stood out and I go and I, she did not live in the housing project, but she lived near it. And the buildings on either side of hers were burned up. They had burned it. They had had wow. fires and they were boarded up. I go to her building and it's this third floor walk up. We go up this narrow staircase and I meet her brother who's older. She lived with her aunt who was her caregiver, her, her aunt, she lived with her aunt and her brother and her son. And then um, her name was Mabel. Mabel. Mabel was my history fair partner. And I meet her brother and her brother is so tall that he has to duck going in under each doorway inside of his own, uh, inside of their apartment. Because the, the building they were living in was built at the beginning of the 1900s. Right. And so people were smaller back then. And so right. just, you know, he could stand fully upright once he was in a room, but just going from room to room, he had to duck his head. It was very, you know, they, and they had like very limited furniture. It was really um, shockingly scary. Julia, mm -hmm. were you in that moment, were you seeing all this difference comparing it to where you were living? Was it, were you aware then this disproportionate impact? of how they were living versus how you were living? Were you seeing it then? Or, or you were, were you aware of it is I guess my question. You no, know, that's the funny thing about looking back on my youth. As a child, I always felt sorry for myself. So when I look back on some of the terrible things that happened to me, I, I realized that things touched me, but sometimes it was on a very sub subconscious level. So I was in that moment very moved by the extreme hardships that Mabel right. was, was living in, but it didn't touch me on a conscious level. I, see. I was more concerned for my own safety. I was like scared now, <laughs> like, how do I, it's getting dark. How do I get back safely to the train station to catch yeah. my, my train home? Yeah. And, and so I was lucky because her brother walked me to the train station. But yeah, it was eye-opening, but not on so much of a conscious level at the time. Right. Okay, so um, we're going to take a break in a minute, Juliet. And when we come back, I would like, and actually, before we come back, let me see if I can capture this. 
essentially you had this opportunity to, to go to the school. You said it was a magnet school. And because of all the trauma that students were experiencing, there was a, a lower demand uh, educationally. You were then able to rise to the top. And as a result of that, you got, I believe, scholarships, right? I did. And that's, that's another one of the privileges that I realized yeah. in hindsight that I yes. enjoyed. Yeah. I never would have guessed at the time. Right. I, I always felt like, sorry for myself because sure. I was a minority at the school because I had to work so many hours outside mm. of school. I, I didn't have, um, I, I felt like an outsider in that environment. And yeah. so I never recognized how much I was benefiting by being in that environment. Yeah. So what we're going to do is when we come back from the break, I want to dive into this realization, you know, exactly how that happened and um, what has happened as a result of that. So we're going to take a pause here. You're listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. Uh, Juliet, just before the break, we were talking about how your um, privileges uh, uh, allowed you to have um, access to scholarships and other things, even though at the time you weren't aware of it. So this realization only recently came to you, all the benefits and hidden advantages that you have being white. I'd like for you to jump into the at this moment, how you came to realize this, how this awareness, the aha moment came to you. Absolutely. You know, it's embarrassing that it, it's taken this moment in history to wake me up. I mean, I feel like the civil unrest that is happening in America right now and the way that we all saw how George Floyd died with a police officer on the job in the company of other officers kneeling on the neck of George Floyd and snuffing out the life that God gave him. We all saw that and we realized, this is my America. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm a part of. And so all of a sudden in my community, eh, I saw these signs saying Black Lives Matter. These signs are everywhere. And I'm hearing the voices of people who say, I am having so much more struggle in my day just because of the color of my skin. And I yeah. thought, that's crazy that all my life I had thought, well, I was the same as, as, um, as anybody else who was oppressed because I grew up in such poverty. Yeah. I had experienced abuse. I had experienced homelessness. I thought, well, surely it's all an economic issue. There's not a racial element to it. Yeah. And, and so I thought, surely I'm not part, I'm not in any way, I'm not a part of this culture of white mm. supremacy. I cannot be a part of it is what I thought because yeah. I thought I was exempt because I, I had, you know, struggled so much, but now I see that I never knew what it was like. Um, to believe that I was less than from day one. I mean, sure, I've experienced what it feels like to feel like I don't belong or I've been put down or right. I'm never going to be good enough, but I've never experienced a need to say, wait a second, I, I matter too. I'm a human being too. You know, there's a, I have to carry a sign to say that I am just as good as to validate my existence. So I yeah. saw that and I thought, this is, I've got to listen. I've got to step yeah. back and realize how can I stop perpetuating this kind of in, endemic abuse? Wow. So this sounds like a tipping point, you know, the, because we all, we know this has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Though there was something that was finally in your face enough to say, hold on a second, you know, this is complete insanity. I know when I heard your, you share that, it made me think about when I was in my early 20s, 
Um, you and I had gone our separate ways and I was now a sophomore at Michigan State. When I was in Michigan State, for people who don't know, well, most people probably do, though for maybe for listeners overseas, Michigan State has 40,000 students on campus, maybe more now, though back when I went there. And uh, there was a lecture being given by um, a, um, some guy who, he wasn't a professor, he was just, a, a vi- maybe he was, let's call him a visiting professor. He, he, all I remember was that he was from somewhere in Scandinavia, and his lecture was on becoming a racist. And essentially what happened was he had been traveling around the US for three or four years. And in that time period, he discovered he had become racist. That before that, he, you know, he had never had that belief system or thinking. And he wrote a book about it. And then that was what the lecture was about. And Juliet, I walked out of that lecture in complete shock because what I realized was I too was a racist. And you know, I grew up in a very liberal East Coast family and you know, everything is, everyone is as a a right to exist, et cetera. And yet I could see the simplicity of this, you know, like one image is when I would see a white, a young white, let's say, you know, 18, 20 year old kid driving a nice car, my brain would go, oh, daddy's rich. Mm-hmm. If I saw a young black man driving oh, a fancy car, my brain would say, hmm, drug dealer? <laughs> <laughs> Insanity. <laughs> Insanity. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. You know, you, you, it's even hard to say it out loud though. That was what my brain did. Yeah. And so, um, it, you know, and what I realize now is I think that, you know, I'm just going to make a sweeping generalization, Juliet. I don't know what you think about this. I think that all white Americans should just assume we're all racist. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. Start from there. That, that's, that's the base, you know, the, the, the foundational point. Baseline, absolutely. Baseline, you know, thank and, you. And not just white Americans, we should all assume that all 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 of us have a bias of some kind everybody has it everybody yeah yeah and so rather than trying to deny it like you were saying i you know i'm not one of those white supremacists well that's a whole nother kettle of fish we're not talking about that we're talking about you know what do unconsciously what do we think and even i can see that i have a bias that is against women which really baffles me as a woman as a someone who i can you know consider myself a feminist and yet I, that there's a bias in my brain towards about women as well. That so is so weird. I have the same bias. I didn't. Oh my gosh. Usually women never admit this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. I and wonder so, if I got it from you. <laughs> <laughs> I loaned you a lot of things. I don't never got that purple sweater back. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so one something I've been working on in as a communication coach and trainer, and when I do these leadership courses, I talk about privilege now. And I talk about how when we have a lot of privilege, that can lead to a sense of entitlement. And that sense of entitlement can lead to something that I call JLB, also known as jerk-like behavior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, and I see people are really, they get a little uncomfortable when I talk about this. And I understand that. And when I talk about privilege, let's, you can throw out some categories. I think of some of the top ones are gender, race, age, education, your position, either in business or society or your organization, income, religion, our health, perceived physical attractiveness, mm. height, weight. Mm physical oh, wow. able-bodiedness yeah and and someone recently added for me you know being on the spectrum or not mm. and there's there's more that i'm forgetting oh yeah you know and these privileges they come and go and they they change according to perhaps what location you live in and and they change with life for example i don't know if i mentioned this to you i've noticed that my privilege privilege of age has been dissipating for the last five or six years Mm -hmm. that, you know, people, right. You too. 
technology. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that happens to men. It just happens maybe 10 or 15 years later to men. Um, and so what I say to, in my trainings is don't waste time feeling guilty. That's not the point. The point is raise your awareness and realize that for many of us, many of the people I work with have many of those privileges. They can tick off the box. Yep, I got that. I got that. I got that. I got that. And the more we have the privilege, the less likely we are to be aware of it because we're in this idea, this position where we had the luxury of not having to think about it. I remember being in a relationship with a guy for, uh, we were together about six years and it was two years after the relationship before I realized that I had the privilege of money that because I was the one earning money he was not earning much. So there was an imbalance though. I, I was always generous and it never occurred to me that this was, could ever be an issue or a problem for him. Mm. Now I want to share one other example. Um, a couple of years ago, you know, I, I live in the French part of Switzerland in this very lily white area <laughs> um, called in the town is Veve, Switzerland. And in Veve, there's a lot of white people. So I was walking down the, uh, along the lake one day and there was some kind of um, dispute going on. There were two police officers and a couple. Let's assume it was a man and wife. Let's assume they were married for the purpose of the story. Well, the wife was screaming to high heaven. So I'm going to guess that the husband did something she was not happy about. And there are two police officers, a man and a woman. The woman was separated talking to the wife, trying to calm her down. And the male police officer was talking to the husband. Well, the male police officer was also black. And they were, the both officers were in uniform. So three white people and one black person. And my brain, turned when I turned away from the store, um, physically turned away and I'm walking down the street, my brain said, ah, oh, the black guy did something wrong. <laughs> I panicked. I said, Amy, Amy, the black guy's the police officer. And I forced myself to turn back around to look See, and I literally, like a little kid, Amy, look, look, the police officer is the black man. I'm like, oh, okay. And I turn back away and, and my brain does it again. Oh, black guy must've done something wrong. I'm like, Amy, Amy. I, it blew my mind how my brain wanted to slot in this storyline. And so what I want to now move to Juliet is, all right, so if we all start with the baseline, we all have some level of racism within us. What can we do about it? Now, what I'd like to share some ideas and I wanna hear what your ideas are. And one thing I've noticed, um, do, do, have you ever seen the television show Scandal? No. Okay, so it's, it's this fantastic show with um, Kerry Washington, an amazing actress who plays the fixer uh, for, in Washington, D.C. and Shonda Rhimes is the producer and this woman is so talented. Now I'm watching an episode where there's a bunch of news reporters are on the front lawn of the white house. You know how they all stand there and they have the camera and they've got their microphone and they're all reporting on whatever the incident is. Juliet, I'm watching this scene and I'm, I'm a little bit destabilized and I'm confused and I'm like, well, there's, there's something weird about this. There's something different. What, what's going on? And that's when I realized that a lot of the reporters were people of color, mm. which maybe until recently we have not seen, no. right? I'm not, and I'm not sure if that's the current reality yet. We, oh, yeah. You yeah. know, it certainly is not then. Okay. So um, sometimes I feel like I miss out not uh, living in the States for a yeah. long time. Sometimes I wonder, you know, if I'm, my measure is accurate. So what this woman has shown is, you know, she's brilliant on so many levels. So here is one beautiful example. What she's doing is she is helping us craft a new narrative so we can retrain our brains. So that for me is one example. And there's so many great shows out there. Dear White People is another show. I think both of those might be on Netflix. I'm not sure. And then another suggestion I have is... Um, I, there was, I think it was a two hour webinar I did with this guy, uh, Dwayne Richards. 
And he, he has this webinar called the Anti-Racism Fight Club. Oh. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it. And apparently he has a kid's version as well, which the kids love. And so he talks in this webinar about how to actively become an anti-racist. And he does it, it's very upbeat, it's very positive, and it's very hands-on, very concrete. One little example is to read authors of color and to, you know, even like buy ch books for your children or your friend's children with, that have multiracial characters in them, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Great examples. So I'm curious to hear from you, what suggestions, ideas, recommendations, what do we do with this awareness? Well, I think the, people in the United States are being forced to look within themselves because we are in the midst of very disturbing civil unrest. There are protests in a, on a constant daily, almost a daily basis to where we wake up in the morning to hear the news that there have been um, deadly consequences from uh, rioting or or protests that are going on in uh, in certain cities and so we have been living through a time in the last six months where we've had a mostly a shelter in place we get encouraged to stay home and what that has the good side of that is that it, it forces you to look within yourself and to really do some reflection and that's mm. the key i think the key to changing it is once we have a consciousness of how it's it's not something we're responsible for, but it's something we're a part of. We, yes. The only way that we could ever hope to change this situation that has gone on for centuries yeah. is, for, is for us to be willing to listen and, and, and analyze and say, oh, maybe, maybe I'm aware now, and now that I'm aware, I can go forward and do better? Well, that's... And that's vague. And I know you have some very concrete, specific suggestions too. So I want to get to those. Though, let's just talk about this beautiful part you just said about one of maybe one of the gifts of lockdown, at least for people in the US, is this, you know, this reflection time, this introspection, this opportunity to look at ourselves and to face that current reality. And I would just really encourage people to just not waste a lot of time in denial or yeah but yeah but that's not me and i've just assume assume you're in you know in the majority that there's racism within your your thinking process i love that and so so the suggestions i have about the television shows the answer racism uh, what you when you and i were talking recently you were talking about some books or suggestions you had yeah, and you know, Amy, what you just said, it just, it just really struck me that that's so liberating. Your strategy is very liberating because I think that the knee-jerk reaction that we all have is to be defensive, and that is wasting a lot of energy. And so yep. if we could just like get over that and realize that we're all part of it, and yep. it's not our fault, it's just part of our, the time in history that we're living through. And it's our so, responsibility. Yes, it's our responsibility once we've become aware that we don't look away and that yeah. we instead listen and, and try to read. And so I've been getting some books that have really been um, speaking to my heart to make me think that I can be better tomorrow and that one of the great books that's just come out by Bishop Michael Curry is called Love is the Way. Oh, wow. I haven't heard about it. Tell me about it. Well, and he is the um, head of the Episcopal Church in the United States. Yeah. Uh, he's a black man who um, married Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Oh. At, yeah. So he presided over their wedding. And, and he, he, he sees what's going on in this country. And he knows from having, he has um, ancestors who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and his father was, I believe, a minister. And so he's, he's looking at the world and saying, we're not going to change the heart of everybody. 
Right. But no movement for change, no movement for social change was ever begun with the masses, with ever, yeah. was ever begun with the majority. It's right. always takes, we got to start with what we have. And so as we're gradually waking up to what needs to happen, and hopefully it's not too late, um, Love is the Way by Bishop Michael Curry, okay. a fantastic book, gives you about how to lead with your heart and how to bridge those, how to figure out how to talk to somebody who doesn't agree with you and nice. realize that it's your relationship you're going to lean on. You're going to lean on your common bond and you're going to go from there and let your heart guide you in, in having a, a, a respectful conversation. They're allowed to have their opinion. We don't right. all have to agree. Juliet, uh, what book is this but, one? And before you're going to tell me about that, I know I because I realized I still want to talk about about the community radio. So give me the other two book names, and then I want to move to the last part before I um, have yeah. to. Wrap other two up. books would be Me and White Supremacy: mm. Combat Racism, Change the World, and Become a Good Ancestor. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. Me and white supremacy. White supremacy. And the thing is about this one is this was a workbook. It started out as a workbook huh. as part of a, like a Facebook challenge where she just said, let's do 30 days of self-analysis and, and trying to change our, our core values. And it caught on like wildfire. And so it's turned into a book and she's, um, well, she's a big deal the author, Layla Saad. And then another great book is White Too Long. And it's mm. the, the legacy of white supremacy in American Christianity. Oh boy. Yeah, White Too Long. Very powerful book about how embedded uh, our biblical beliefs are in the, in the United States, they're married to beliefs of white supremacy. I mean, every every picture of Jesus that you typically right. see, he's a white man. Exactly. Yeah, look at what part of the world he came from. Yeah. You know? So I would add to that book list, th those are rich examples. And the one I would add to the book list is, so you want to talk about race. Um, that I've just finished listening to the audio book of that, and that's fantastic and really poignant. So we're giving listeners out there ideas, suggestions, way to take actions. I want to, um, before we wrap up, I really want to ask you a little bit, and we don't have much time, about um, how and why you see public radio as a tool for social change. Public radio really has has affected me on, on such a deeply resonant le level. I, I, I connect with the, the programming in so many ways because it opens up my mind to a message of hope, a healing message, um, because I, it, it introduces topics that are tough to discuss. Right. And then it gives you the tools to really do the hard work of, of, digging through a topic and understanding it so that you can um, begin to know how you can um, be a part of the, the change you want to see in the world. So yeah. I, I guess the main thing for me, though, with public radio, the way it happened for me personally, because everybody wants to hear a personal story, is that, you know, I've spent a lot of time in my life wasting energy, feeling sorry for myself and feeling like an outsider and feeling pessimistic. Yeah. And in the early 1990s, uh, I was in that mindset. I was finishing up graduate school and I tuned in to my favorite radio station, or station KUNM FM in Albuquerque. And they uh -huh. had a special show called the I Am Music Show on Thursday nights from seven to 10. And it's, it's reggae music. But oh, no yes, my favorite. And, and most importantly, though, is this healing message right. of, of love and positive vibrations. And I, I feel those, uh, those vibrations. I feel that, that sense of that intention that the hosts come on that show to, to send out that message of inclusivity and, 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 and appreciation for others. And, and so I catch those vibes and I depend on those vibes and they lift me up. And it's like a religious experience for me listening to the music. Wow. 
reggae music. And I have to add to that, Juliet, and I know we're just about out of time, though I, my, my first exposure to reggae, I don't know if I told you this, I was 18 years old and I had come from this huge family, as you know, I'd never been by myself for more than two hours at a time. So I decided <laughs> by the time I was 18, I'm going to go to dinner by myself and I'm going to go to a movie by myself. I'd never eaten dinner so fast in my life. <laughs> the movie was Jimmy Cliff, The Harder They Come. And I never remember hearing reggae before that. And I, I was in that, that theater moving. I couldn't stop moving. And yes. the accents were so strong. I couldn't understand a lot of what they were saying at the time, though all I knew was this music inspires me. And it, it yes. to this day, yes. So we're going to have to start wrap up here, Jules. And I am so grateful for the time you've taken. Thank you for sharing what you have from your heart and the suggestions of the books that you've made. And I want to add one more call to action for the listeners. And that is to send me your communication conundrums, clashes, challenges, mishaps, and blunders. And, and in particular, in relationship to this topic, I would really love to hear how you're challenging yourself or the people around you to become an anti-racist and what you're doing to challenge your own inner racist thoughts. Because for me, that's the active participation that, that will, will help move all of us forward. And to send me those emails, you can send me an email at amy at carol coaching.com and that's two r's and two l's so juliet once again thank you for being here really appreciate it you know and thank you for opening up this this tinder box you know this is really a hard conversation and i appreciate you being willing to be brave enough to to tackle it and and inviting me along i feel like it's it's good for me i want to be a part of this thank you Listen, um, if you do want to hear and continue this conversation, feel free to reach out to me on my social media channels, Amy Carroll Coaching. If you're game for more, I'll be hopping on my Facebook Live in five minutes past the hour, so you can reach, my, reach me there. And next week, I'll be interviewing leadership coach and expert Robert Kahn, founder of Leader Like You. Among other things, we're going to be talking about the power of one little word that can cause havoc in all of our communication. So be sure to tune in. You've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Thanks, everyone, and happy partnering.